one of the uh, one of the important uh, questions that confronts any constitutional um, system is uh, is the way in which it balances um, the necessity of protecting its citizens and, and ensuring national security, while at the same time um, ensuring uh, freedom. And that balance is, is universal in constitutional systems. Uh, it will always be with us. And, um, and it's really the, the infrastructure that we rely on to manage the way we strike that balance that is meant throughout the book when um, the contributors refer to constitutional governance. And that was also the, the terminology that Senator Church and the committee preferred. They referred to, um, to constitutional governance. And it really has two, two facets. When we're thinking about the, the power exercised by the intelligence community, constitutional governance really has, has two forms. First, something as simple as whether or not the executive should obey the law. If Congress has an acted law um, with respect to the operations of the intelligence community, um, should the intelligence community and um, should the executive abide by that law? That's, that's one sort of um, lower level um, meaning of constitutional governance. And uh, it really raises one of the essential questions of American constitutional history. Is anyone above the law? And uh, we learn the seminal case Marbury versus Madison, all the way through U.S. versus Nixon, that in our constitutional scheme, no one, no man, is above the law, not the executive, not the president. Um, so that that's one layer. When when the contributors to the book refer to constitutional governance, when when Frank Church and the committee spoke of constitutional governance as the driving value of uh, behind the investigation. Um, they meant simply should the executive and should the intelligence community be beholden to law. On, uh, on a deeper level, um, in the absence of, of explicit legislation, in the absence of explicit law with respect to particular intelligence activities, constitutional governance um, requires us to answer the question What, what are the checks, constitutional checks, maybe not direct law, but what are the constitutional checks placed on the activities of a branch of government, like the executive branch, under the executive, the intelligence community? And um, what we learn from the structure of our Constitution is that um, the branches, uh, no branch is meant to have limitless power that the structure of the Constitution places Congress, the judiciary, and the executive in tension with one another. And it's that tension that operates to limit the power of the three branches. And um, so even in the absence of law, constitutional governance poses the question, um, what, what structural limits operate on the executive when pursuing national security interests. Um, and the answer to that has to be there is a role for Congress. That's the lesson um, of the Church Committee, and it's an emerging lesson with respect to the war on terror. There is a role for Congress in questions of national security and intelligence, whether that's oversight, whether that's enacting legislation that empowers um, the intelligence community to protect the United States which, interestingly, the Democratic Congress in the War on Terror has consistently done with respect to um, the USA Patriot Act, with respect to granting immunity to private telecommunications firms um, that uh, helped the executive spy on Americans. Um, consistently, Congress has empowered the intelligence community, but that role alone represents a kind of, of limit, a kind of oversight and a kind of check on the power of the executive.
So it's really those two layers that, uh, that are meant when we talk about, when the contributors to the book talk about constitutional governance. Direct um, legislation that limits, that seeks to limit and direct intelligence activities. And secondly, then, the broader question of, of limitations on, on the branches through the, the checks and balances in our constitutional scheme.